Hello and welcome to the Poor Hammer Podcast, episode 58. I'm your host, Brad. This is my co-host, Eric. How's it going? And on this week's episode, it is time to board some omens that are arky or something. We're doing a breakdown of boarding actions, finally. That sounded very inappropriate and against YouTube's terms of service. Hey, they just loosened those up so that we can swear more naturally again. (laughs) That's true. It is nice. I mean, we did it anyways, but... But now we won't get demonetized. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, boarding action. All right, so I guess let's get into the section proper and we will walk through how we're going to handle this. Sounds good. All right, Brad, why are we talking about boarding action? That was the spice of six weeks ago. I know, because it takes that long to actually get anything properly tested so you can review it. That doesn't sound like what we do here in 2023 with the social media. So uh, it took us a while to print all of our boarding action train. (laughs) because no one was paying 210 US dollars to buy GWs. And since we 3D print so much, we decided to just do it the way we found most natural. And the amount of money spent to do it be damned. Uh, Yeah, we'll get into that. (laughs) And then we spent a couple weeks actually playing it, of which Eric was there for none of due to other problems. Yeah. So this is going to be fun as I tell Eric about how all of his friends enjoyed the last couple weeks. Yeah, it's been been a problematic couple of weeks and definitely missed out on this, which is disappointing, but it'll be interesting to hear how things went. All right, so for how we're going to handle this episode, first we're going to go over how to play boarding actions just real quick. Then we're going to talk about our findings as we played it, give a general review of it. We'll talk about how we ended up handling the terrain situation and pros and cons of how we handled it and other possibilities and we'll talk about our final verdict on it as a game format and how we think it ended up being successful and not basically a powerpoint presentation shut up (laughs) but on a more serious side what is boarding action All right, let's start off with how to play. You need the rules for boarding actions to actually play, including actual rules for setting up the board and all that for each match. Those are only available in Arcs of Omen Abaddon. Which, good luck acquiring that if you haven't already a quick google search says it's out of stock on gw's website and knowing how these things are stocked it will never come back luckily there are alternative methods of the dot ru variety (laughs) there is also the post on warhammer community for the individual factions explaining the faq kind of stuff yeah you'll need that as well but that's free and actually available in the correct manner so that's fine yeah which hey props on that you didn't print a 20 dollar little booklet with six pages so you need all of that stuff then you need actual terrain to play it on because boarding actions is played on a unique terrain set the games workshop solution is 210 us dollars there are famous alternatives which we talked about on a previous episode where we were designing like a perfect intro box type deal but there is solutions that involve using children's toy to build up your your own versions and then you can 3d print versions you can use paper you could try just setting it up with paper and stuff if you really want to try it for super cheap but there's other solutions that are not 210 dollars is what i'm getting at yes with all of that put together you end up ready to play other than your actual army construction which to give you the long and short of it it's played at 500 points you need zero to one hq zero to three troops zero to three elites all your units have to be either a five model unit a 10 model unit or if it's got a less than five models in a unit as a unit size it must be minimum size also everything has to be infantry no fly all sorts of restrictions that then get mutated by the faqs for each faction and that's why you need the faq section and it kind of makes sense because like you're supposed to be in close quarters so like it's infantry kind of stuff when we get to our findings you would not want to play monsters or vehicles in this anyway yeah so with all of that together you and your opponent can set up the board 
play some matches and see how it goes from there. There are currently, as we record this, no stratagems. I believe next week stratagems exist for about half the factions in a new Arcs of Omen book. Hold on, that's not true. There are three stratagems. There are the three basic stratagems that everyone has access to, which is the reroll, insane bravery, and interrupt. Yeah, counteroffensive. We're not calling it whatever its official term was. I've never learned it. <laughs> no one says, I'm going to counteroffensive. They say, I'm going to spend two CP to interrupt. Yes. That's fair. So another key thing when you're building boarding patrols is your HQ does not get the relics or the warlord traits in your codex. You get a list of enhancements that are in the Abaddon Arcs of Omen thing until in the Vashtor Arc of Omen thing, they're going to add some unique ones for each faction, which gets really confusing to get into. That's not confusing at all, but... This, this comes in later when we get to the reviews and the final verdict on all this. But if you can't tell from the tone in my voice i have feelings <laughs> and i'm sure they're positive so getting into actually playing it though let's talk about what we found while playing it and our general review of it i will say going in it is mostly positive i actually like this format as much as i was poo-pooing it at first i think the 210 dollar terrain gave a very bad first impression it is very clearly one of those game modes that is created to sell a different product you know this game mode was made as an excuse to sell the terrain set but if we ignore that that doesn't mean it's inherently bad and that said this is one of the best gw rule sets i've seen i know everyone has said war cry is the best one i haven't played it yet but of the gw games i have either seen or played firsthand this one has some of the best care put into the rules okay they thought of a lot of things and the faqs in particular really thought of everything everything in air quotes here Right. There are corner cases where when we were constructing lists for like our first and second game, we were like, why did they even bother FAQing this specific nerf or whatever? And then you play a couple rounds and you go, oh, that's why. <laughs> They really did playtest this when they made those FAQs. This was not blind guessing. Like I've felt with certain FAQs before or certain data slate changes where I feel like it's just darts at a board. Right. These were very well thought out. I'm happy to see that GW has gone through the effort of making a 500 point game balanced and thought out. Yes. This is exactly what we were hoping was the case a couple episodes ago when we were going over this. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about what we found. We played a little over five-ish games between all of us. It's not exactly enough, in my opinion, to give a good review, but we are very experienced when it comes to playing various games, and half of us have amateur game design backgrounds, and we're all very good at taking notes, and it looked awful and unfun to outsiders, I'm sure, but we enjoyed it. <laughs> Nerd. There is something special about midway through a game you're trying to win, you're writing notes about the game design of the game. <laughs> Yeah, that does tend to happen, and that is kind of cool. So let's talk about the very first game we played. I played against one of our playgroup members. He played Space Wolves. I played Thousand Suns. It was a Vengeance for Prospero match. We didn't think about that when we were throwing our list together, but it, that's what it turned out to be. Ignoring the fact that I terribly misplayed and forgot my own army rule the entire game, and not once that I remember to use all his dust. How are you so bad at that? I... <laughs> I don't know. It was literally the next day when I was like, oh my god, I forgot all his dust on every save roll. No wonder I felt like I was getting destroyed. <laughs> it's ridiculous that <laughs> you forget that when everybody's like, oh my god, they nerfed. It's, it's been a long few weeks. That was a rough game. That's fair. So anyway, other than shaking the dust off, no pun intended. Wow. We ended up taking a bunch of notes during that game. I took a very basic list. I took an Exalted Sorcerer. I took like 15 rubrics, some of which had flamers, most of which were your standard five-man loadout you've seen a million times. And then I took my one allowed unit of fast attack chaos spawn that Thousand Suns are allowed to take. And I took three in that, even though I realized you're only allowed to take one after this. Okay, I was going to say, I was like, we talked about the min... 
I'm telling you the rules, how they're supposed to be, and then I'm telling you how we screwed them up. Yeah, how you learned the rules as you messed up, yeah. So the Chaos Spawn thing was a little bit weird, especially because I don't know why you would take just the one with how it turned out and how I felt about it in that game. He took some Terminators and some Vanguard Vets and a Captain. It was your basic Space Marine jam. It seems like the basic starting point. We learned a lot over the course of the game, and we screwed up more than one rule as we were shaking off the dust. Things we found in this game was I took the enhancement for plus one strength and plus one damage on your weapon as like a pseudo relic. Okay. In the boarding action rules, it's called your trademark weapon, which sounds awful, by the way. That's a terrible name. It's atrocious. And he didn't know what to take, so he said, screw it, I'll take the extra two CP. Because this is a 500 point game in Ark of Omens, you only start with one CP. He started with two more CP. We misread the underdog thing and thought it was whoever is lower gets the underdog. Like there's an AOS thing for if you're the lower of the two people, you get your special bonus thing. Okay. We thought that was underdog. Underdog requires a 30 point spread before it turns on though. So oops, we screwed that one up. So he got an extra CP for that. And then the beginning of the turn, he got a fifth CP. So he started the game on five CP. It's pretty good. In a 500 point game. It sounds very powerful. CP is worthless. (laughs) <laughs> when there are no stratagems and there is no pre-game doing stuff, CP is actual trash. He ended the game on 7 CP. So one of the things is like you can only do so many command rerolls. You can max at one per turn and you gain one CP every turn. Yeah, the don't take morale problems. You only get once a game, right? Yes, and to be honest, it's even more, if you're playing Space Marines and you're stuck at min squad size. Like, it's just not going to happen. The chance of it occurring in the first place is never going to happen. Yeah, but like, even if you did, that's only 2 CP the entire game. Yep. So it's all really just like, when do you want to use interrupt? Did you have to blow interrupts? Yep. And were you being overly conservative in case of needing to use an interrupt? Which he was. He should have re-rolled a little bit more often. He tended to save it a bit too much. Hopefully that changes when there's stratagems introduced. Yeah, and it does show the whole, there are too many stratagems in 40k. No one's going to disagree with that. Anyone who's played 40k 9th edition knows there's too many strats. Yeah. There's too many bad strats where this unit on a day in April where it's raining in the northern hemisphere hemisphere, whatever. You have like these awful stratagems that should not exist. You should have nice army-wide strats that are very easy to just use and trigger on whatever you want. But no strats is too far the other way. You feel like you have no impact on the game outside of CP reroll and pray. Right. And especially as the non-active player kind of thing. It's one of those where it's like, oh, I'm just getting my face kicked in and there's not anything I can do about it kind of thing. <laughs> Whereas like strats at least give you like, oh, I could I could play defensively and have this option. Yeah, there's no spending CP on transhuman. As much as I think transhuman is too spammed in Space Marines, you get the point. Right. It is nice to see that like this is too far. Mm-hmm. Stratagems are still useful as, a, as an ideal. And we'll get back to some faction balance stuff that's going to tie back to stratagems a little. We, in this game, also learned how very strong Obsec is. He should have lost this game terribly. I'm not just saying that as a, like, I lost it, I'm a sore loser thing, but, like, had I remembered to actually give myself plus one to save for every single damage I took the whole game because he had all damage one weapons, except for some hammers that didn't ever make it to melee, it is kind of busted how important Obsec is. There is an action in boarding actions that you can use on an obsec unit to make the objective you're standing on sticky so then you can leave that and still control it and as anyone who's played 500 point games in normal 40k when like teaching newbies yeah you know that if anything is the most important and why 500 point games can be so swingy and low point it's you don't have enough units for action economy to actually do anything of value because you're all stuck standing on back points yep The sticky objectives really help that. We could argue if making obsec that important because only obsec units can do it is bad or good. I think it's pretty good because it makes obsec matter a lot. 
Like usually obsec units, when you look at them, are they're taxed for being your obsec unit. And you're always like, eh, I don't really want to take it. I want to take the better unit math wise and just find a way to cheat and give it obsec or just blow your opponent off the point and not care about obsec in the first place. Personally, I think obsec is one of the strongest things in 40k for winning. I think you're misunderstanding. Obsec all is. That definitely you're thinking of when I play Necrons and I have a Wraith on your home point taking it on turn one. Yes, that definitely is. That's different than a unit that has OBSEC. Yes, it is. But I still think you underestimate or undervalue OBSEC just generally. So I would say that OBSEC in 40k as a whole, when it is not an OBSEC all thing where you're abusing giving OBSEC to something that shouldn't have it, doesn't have much punch. Whereas in boarding actions, you have to have a very strong reason to take something that doesn't have it. We also found in this game, Overwatch feels very interesting. Overwatch does not work like it does in 40k. It's not a stratagem. It's an action that you do at the end of movement. And it works like overwatching like XCOM and tactics games where you go, I'm not going to shoot. Instead, I'm going to overwatch. And like my units are going to sit here. And when something gets in range of them and moves, they're going to automatically shoot it. Which honestly is how I always thought overwatch was supposed to be. <laughs> so for what it's worth, I think it works that way in either an old edition or in Horus Heresy or Kill Team or somewhere. It works different like that. I mean, I like that as a style more, but that's also my own like XCOM and that type of thing, biasing the opinion there. <laughs> because of that, if you have the ability to do an action and shoot without failing it, that's incredibly strong in boarding actions. Okay, I see what you're saying. And I think that there's like a kind of baked in way of getting five up for Overwatch. Yeah, you can do set to defend or you can do the Overwatch on fives thing. Which altogether sounds interesting, especially because of how like the door hatch is open and line of sight changes, even if you're not moving. And there is some interesting stuff we noticed that's smaller, like with how line of sight was functional that didn't impact the game very much but was unique and interesting to look at it felt less like a thing you would want in proper 40k and more like it was correct for this game mode if that makes sense which is stuff where you couldn't shoot through your own unit like you can in 40k where if you have right. two rows of guys the back guys are still allowed to shoot in this you had to do like a weird slightly space out like so you, every guy has its own line of sight from its base Right. Which, I mean, it makes sense. Like, we're in close quarters, so, like, actually making this stack up behind a door, if you do it properly, it makes sense. Right. And it feels right for the game mode, but in actual 40k, it sounds like even more annoyance with people being super specific on how they're moving their models, which is what eats up way too much time. Yeah, at 2k points. It would become a nightmare. Yeah, for such a little payoff. I also liked how they handled the idea, because 40k 9th edition, we all know, is very cover-based. Yeah. They handle it really interesting with this, where if you have partial view of a base, it has cover. If you can draw a line to the entire of their base, it has no cover. I really liked how that worked. Okay. I don't think I want that for 40k. The current terrain rules are better than that in 40k, but it makes way more sense given the game mode. Yeah, I do like the idea of base mattering. That is neat. If everything's in infantry, like, it just makes sense to go base for everything, basically. Hey, and it makes our 2D acrylic resiny model idea from that episode make even more sense for this. But I can understand why when you go to the full game, it, it kind of breaks down on certain things. It's kind of more exciting to be like, oh, that's a big, huge monster or that's a flying thing. Like, yeah. OK, fair enough. Yeah. If the knight is standing behind a wall, does it really get cover? Yeah, exactly. Like, OK, I get it. There's a reason 40K's rules are different. In this mode, I am happy to see that they're just like, no, go to the base. It's easy. It's clean. And it makes sense. Yeah, and as we get to the future matches, there's a couple other things we noticed, but these were some big ones. And I don't really know if they're all pros or cons, but they are things that felt different that I think leads to our findings down the road with how we ended up playing later games. Okay. The universal secondaries are cute, especially at a 500 point game. We've played a lot of 500 point normal games of 40k compared to most people because we learned at the beginning of 9th edition, our whole playgroup learned, we've got more learning games with like me teaching my wife, stuff like that. 
Right. Uh, so I've played a shocking number of 500 point games compared to the average person because 500 points is not what 40k is balanced around and you have to like go out of your way to not break it. Yeah. I will say that this solves so many of those issues. One, the universal secondaries is way better than trying to pick secondaries like in 40k for 500 points. It's just like a, if you own these specific objectives at the end of the game, you get an extra 10 points. If you killed your opponent's warlord, you get an extra 10 points. Done. It's clean. And I mean, it is nice to be like, everybody on the same page there's no like oh what was is that was that something that you were supposed to get points for and we all know what everything's doing i think everyone universally liked that at the low point count not saying it has to be in large point games but it's really nice to save time another thing is time that's one of the things that like we've played a couple 500 point games of like we've got a couple hours not even before like we gotta go 2k point army we're not gonna get past the second turn so what do we do yeah it's not balanced but let's just throw some small models on the board and see what happens for fun yeah and usually we would do a thousand points because it's just that's what we've graduated to yeah but 500 points is okay for that this game mode is the fastest game mode i've played for 40k proper nice it's downright bite-sized i'd say once we learned the rules the average game was probably an hour uh you spend a considerable amount of time actually building boards unfortunately does that include the setup that's separate and that gets into part of the problem and that's why it's not all glowing but it is mostly positive there are downsides to the mode and setup time is one of them if you can trust someone to set the board up in advance when it's like hey jeff i'm coming over your house later get the board set up and we'll play because we We've only got two hours between me getting there and us having to go out. Right. You'd be fine in that case. But if you show up and start setting it up, you're probably spending 30 minutes getting the board set up with two people arguing, pulling the page back and forth, trying to read (laughs) where the thing is supposed to be lined up. Right, right. So that's like a minor downside to it. But the upside is... Oh my god, the games go quick, they feel good, all the door mechanics feel awesome. It's weird, I thought I was gonna hate them. So, the door mechanic is like, everybody has an action that they can like, try and force open the door... Yeah, so you move for your turn, the the movement phase works as normally, and then after reserves come in, everyone can do an action at the end of move to open a door that finishes immediately. Like, it's like a zero moment action, but it is an action, so you can't do, like, fall back and do it. Right. But you can open the door after moving. It's really cool, because you then get to do the, like, put your model within an inch of the door and try to keep it closed there's like payoff there and when a door bursts open it becomes like a barricade in 40k where it gets like the two inch fight around it so if you open a door that you guys were contesting you are instantly in combat nobody charged you are just in combat when the combat phase comes (laughs) that is cool This was leveraged to my advantage because I was able to get into combat with a space marine without triggering charge shit, which is difficult. (laughs) Honestly, that's pretty big. So I really liked how the door mechanics worked, and I think we all did, like, over the course of all these games, I think we ended up just enjoying doors. There was several times when someone felt clever because they knew not to open a door because they were going to get Overwatch killed if they opened it. You could funnel people different directions utilizing the Overwatch action, knowing they wouldn't want to go a certain direction. Yeah. When I'm saying these Overwatches, though, it is important that I'm talking about Flamer Overwatch. Non-Flamer Overwatch might as well not exist still, and it is a downside. When Overwatch is a full action like this, I strongly believe it should have been you get a normal shooting phase. It's just triggered at a different timing. You're delaying your shooting phase for when it would work. Because it does require you to give up You're like, I'm not going to shoot because I can only get one guy to shoot one thing, maybe. I'm just going to overwatch so the next thing something ends in movement range, I get to shoot it all. So in other tactical games like that, there's usually like a slight disadvantage kind of thing that you get because it's like, oh, they're potentially like surprising you from a different, you know, you weren't like you're ready, but you're not like completely in control of when it's going to happen. So you have this more or less the same, but slight downside. Sure, and if that's a, you shoot but at minus one to hit, that's probably still fine. I would accept if that's the correct call. That's kind of what I would would make sense to me, but again, like I said, I I didn't play it, but uh, it does feel tough. Yeah, because we found very quickly no one cared about Overwatch unless you had like a five flamer squad, and suddenly you're like, I'm a Overwatch. (laughs) (laughs) 
And it's like, oh, that hallway is off limits. Let's go around. Moving on from there, we ended up doing several more rounds. Different people played each other. A couple things we noticed was large models have huge disadvantages. These hallways are only three inches wide whenever there's columns. Okay. But that means if you've got a bunch of 40 mil bases, you end up like at weird corner areas or going through like a door that leads into a corner through a hall type stuff. You end up with really awkward conga lines trying to get like three 40 mil bases following each other and you can't like ever organize properly to get all of your 40 mil units useful. Right. This is a big downside. Like... It makes it so I never wanted to use my chaos spawn again after like I played three of them in a unit, which I know wasn't legal. We found out. <laughs> yeah. But in that first game, I played three of them in a unit and we were like, OK, they're bad. <laughs> <laughs> like it's very hard and thousand suns gets extra rules in this to make up for us not having our normal strat we spam to make chaos spawn actually good in our army you would never ever want an equivalent to a chaos spawn if it's even like a legal elite in your army another thing we noticed in later games our death guard player pointed this out when he played typhus you really don't want like 200 points wrapped up in a single character it is nice to point that out but like it's a 500 point game anytime you have half your points in one model it's usually different though because usually the problem is it's a 500 point game do not bring a 250 point model because it's broken in this game right because you can smash your big bird or your loaded out hive tyrant or something in yeah, yeah. where your opponent just doesn't have the firepower to deal with it yeah but because of the type limits and all that in this game you end up not having those scenarios and instead you just find out like it's basically impossible for typhus to ever make his points back you should have just brought more of something else and a cheaper character. Yeah, and it also doesn't help that like you don't get access to your normal relics and whirler trades. It's like, And that was another thing that's worth pointing out when we're talking about balance between the factions. If you're a faction, like Thousand Sons, where your characters are playing Hero Hammer and everyone's got a relic and a warlord trait or your army sucks, yeah, enhancements suck. <laughs> <laughs> You don't you don't want generic enhancements to be the future. They're bad. You basically end up picking either the one that's like you can try opening a door before moving just in the chance that you end up in a scenario where that gains you ground or you end up picking just plus one strength plus one damage and hope you end up in melee combat with your warlord and that your warlord is good in melee combat to begin with. Sorry, Necrons. Wow. I would never, ever, ever, ever want to play a destroyer heavy list in this, by the way. I flat out after two games realized I was going to do game three as Necrons. I looked at the list I had built and i immediately was like i'm not playing necrons okay large bases melee only yeah. mediocre moves and you just end up thinking like i am going to pay 130 or 140 or whatever points for some score pack destroyers and i'm never going to be able to get points out of them and they don't have obsec by default so they're a bad pick all sorts of stuff that does kind of bring a question that i'm interested in hearing your results on our movement because you can't like go through walls other than like opening up a door how is movement they've limited like fast attacks and they've limited a lot of the very fast movement stuff like so how does that actually feel in this they tend to have thought of everything if you can think of an exception in your army it's probably faq'd like the teleports and all that stuff yeah basically if you don't think you need to open a door should always be advancing which i honestly we screwed up in game one until like turn four i didn't realize my opponent had advanced twice because i wasn't paying much attention we were drinking and talking <laughs> i didn't realize you could advance because i was like they took away all the other movement abilities why would they leave advancing in the game okay you can advance and basically if you don't advance you fucked up i guess that makes sense especially if you haven't opened up a lot of line of sight yet yeah, and if you're an advance and charge army, I assume you're very busted. Okay. Charging in this is huge because if you can land a 7-inch charge, that's an extra move phase you got. Right. But there is the thing, like, you can't declare a charge if you don't have line of sight, right? Yeah, you can't do it around corners and stuff, which feels very correct. If you could do that, oh my god. Without that, then yeah, that advance and charge seems dumb busted. But I do think that that pulls it back a little bit of there's still defensive options of, okay, I'm gonna hide around the corner <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. And 
with everyone being infantry, you end up re considering what the correct loadouts for stuff is like often in full 40k games you're like hey i gotta bring my meltas or something like that just in case they show up with some tanks or something you need to have the ability to deal with tanks even if it doesn't really come up yeah some a lot of spamming of mid-level ap one damage seems to be the way to go okay mortal wounds are also busted in low point games as we all know and that carried Thousand Suns hard when I was playing them. So on that question about Psychic, they did make the Psychic thing similar to uh, the shooting where like, you can't go through your own things for you know the ones that need line of sight and are mortals. Yeah, it takes line of sight and everything takes line of sight. How did that feel? Fine. I was Thousand Suns. Every unit has Psychic. You and I won't care. Okay. It's probably more obnoxious for people who have, like, one utility psyker. And it just feels like it's not able to do anything until, like, it gets once. You could end up screwing yourself because you've got the wrong unit between you and the unit you want to be buffing. Right. So I could see that being obnoxious, but, like, in Thousand Suns, I was like, I'm just shitting mortals. <laughs> okay. I, I took the loadout I usually take if I want to win a low point game, which is a lot of Doom Bolt variants and stuff, and taking my flame rebuff thing, which I found out was a big mistake. <laughs> I was not used to the fact that I could not cast and Overwatch, if that makes sense. Oh, right, because like the Overwatch is like an ability. Overwatching required you not to cast. Yeah. So there was a whole bunch of weird little stuff when I was learning. That's for like specifics if you were like trying to like really gain a faction but just for casual play with your friends that's not important okay we will say that named characters are a double-edged sword but mostly positive most named characters come with their built-in relics that are just you know a named thing on their data sheet they usually get like a secondary warlord trait that's just the fact that they have an extra ability for no reason because it's lore okay yeah like, my brother brought Mephiston once. Mephiston has a lot of rules on his data sheet you don't know. Just because no one plays Mephiston, because you could play a custom character that you build out the way you want. Right. But if you can't build out how you want... Yeah, Mephiston has a lot of fucking rules on him. Fair enough. I brought Rakarth when I was playing as Drukhari. Rakarth is automatically the upgraded version of a homunculus. You're not allowed to upgrade homunculi in boarding actions. But you're allowed to bring Rakarth. Okay. So that let me unlock playing Homoxylites. So that was cool and was definitely a positive. <laughs> now the downside is when you play like this, you don't get an enhancement. But as I've talked about, I think most enhancements are incredibly mediocre. Yeah, which is fair, I guess. <laughs> So I would say factions with cheap named characters with a shitload of rules are probably the winners there. Okay. But at the same time, like there is the downside of like the more expensive characters kind of thing. Yeah. And you don't want to go too high on your expense per character for sure. Right. I think that wraps up most of the things we noticed as far as findings go. Before we get into the final verdicts, let's talk about how we handled terrain. Yeah. So we 3D printed. We've talked previously about the ideas others have had of using the magnetic kids toys and building up your own train that way. I support doing that. It's pretty cool. Definitely. But we 3D print in this house. <laughs> 3D printer goes burr. I paid my brother 15 bucks to go buy us. It is a set from Cults 3D by the user Warlock 3D Models called Derelict Damage Spaceship Compatible Murder Team or Small Corridor Games. Legally distinct. <laughs> Legally distinct, indeed. So I paid him 15 bucks. He bought these and we started printing them. I told him I would pay for all the resin. And here are my findings. The boarding actions terrain is kind of clever in the fact that it's so much material that to Games Workshop is five cents because it's bulk plastic. Yeah. But it actually ends up being very expensive to 3D print this much terrain. Okay. So we didn't print bases. We just played on a normal playmat to the correct size, right? Yeah, which... Uh, obviously. <laughs> it's less cool, but it saved us resin. We still 
to make the accurate number of walls and door walls and pillars and all that stuff. Yeah. It was over two bottles of resin. My brother uses nicer resin nowadays than we used to. We used to use the bulk, cheapest, garbagest, any cubic photon resin, just the worst crap. He's got an 8K printer now, so it can actually use nice resin. And as an aside, we'll eventually do episodes about 3D printing, I'm sure. Yeah. They're very cool. We have a lot of 3D printing advice over the years, but there is a difference between resin. We use a better resin now that costs like an extra 10 bucks per liter. It was on sale currently, so I ended up bulk buying more just to hide it to bribe him later when I have projects, but it was still over 30 bucks a bottle and I had him use over two bottles doing this. So we're looking at $15 for the terrain and we'll call it 80 bucks for the resin because that would be the normal price for two bottles. Yeah, I was going to say like, so you're about a hundred bit over. Almost a hundred dollars to do the cheap version of just print it yourself, which is normally for any solution five times cheaper than whatever GW is offering you. Right. But it does kind of make sense because the volume of actual plastic, because it's just walls. It's not like, oh, here's a, you know, a, a miniature that it's intricate and small. No, this is just, it's a slab of plastic with some detail on it. <laughs> Yeah, and I really like this terrain, and if you are looking for a 3D solution, and that is your price range, and you're fine with spending that much, and you're interested in boarding actions, I don't know this person, they didn't sponsor us, I paid full price, I'll never meet them. This is a solid terrain set. It printed well, it was all pre-supported, my brother's 3D printer is all honed in, so it was literally just slap and go. I think we had one fail build plate on the entire run, and to be honest, it was because his FEP was wearing out. Although... I won't say it's his own fault either. Because these are so much material being printed at once, you're probably putting wear on your FEP. That makes sense. And if we're being honest, I probably should consider one replacement of his FEP as part of my increase in cost. It may end up costing you an extra 20 bucks more for that. But that that gets into the whole upkeep part of yeah. trying to print this much. Because like this is probably as much resin as a full army, like beyond 2,000 points full army. Oh, yeah. We've done a lot more projects that were not two bottles worth of resin, so... When he told me I'm halfway done and I'm already through a whole bottle, I, like, double-checked. I was like, you started with, like, half a bottle? He's like, no, I've used over one liter of resin. Yeah. Oh, no, this is more expensive than I thought. How many did you screw up kind of thing? <laughs> and it's like, no... It's just a lot of actual plastic, so it makes sense. But dude, the actual end result, very cool. Oh, I love it. It'll be even cooler once it's all primed and then painted. Yeah, I would highly recommend this. We only glued on like two doors. The doors are beautiful. They slot in so well. Everything's very nice. 10 out of 10. Honestly, the doors are pretty cool. Like, yeah, 90% of them are laying on the floor when you look at them just to show the door is open. But for the ones that actually swing on their hinges that we bothered to super glue before priming everything, <laughs> those ones are hella sweet. <laughs> How was the assembly, like, snapping together modularity? Oh, it's super easy. For our resin ones, it, like, I heard the GW ones may have some issues with grinding or whatever. These just slot right together. Okay. That was one of those where I was like, there's very easily possibilities of that being an annoyance. So it's kind of nice to hear that for the price and effort of 3D printing these, it worked out. Yeah, if you end up printing these, don't glue the caps on the pillars put them on after you put the pillar in the slots it'll make sense whenever you're assembling this terrain for a game you'll be like oh this is why i don't put the cap on the pillar until after i've assembled it because it like nicely locks everything together and it makes it hard to pull apart okay that makes sense overall though for a verdict i will say this is the best 500 point game mode they've made from a balance perspective for a future of like if competitive games wanted to go this way, you'd probably end up with better tournaments. I'm not saying this is great for gameplay fun. You and I are both fans of big flashy monsters and vehicles. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> this was very interesting. I really enjoyed this. I will probably continue playing this as long as it's supported as like a, hey, we've only got two hours, let's play boarding actions instead of a game. Right. Instead of like our 1K, hey, let's get a quick game in, a boarding action would sound fun. Yeah, but it would depend on if I have an idea in my head of like, I want to play my Forge Fiend. 
Because if I want to play a big model, you can't in this, uh, which is a negative to it. Yeah, and honestly, as much as I've had other stuff going on, a big draw for me is like playing cool big models and stuff like that. And it's like, I don't know, man. (laughs) I will say there's some like balance concerns long term. We didn't play too much. We played just enough to where we started having concerns and writing them down of like shooting armies. I think being a shooting army would be awful in this because it is very rare if you have a line of sight longer than 12 inches. You're basically always in flamer range if you're visible. Right. You are always in bolter range if you're visible. I couldn't find anywhere where you're like, hey, I've got line of sight. What's the range? And it's like, oh, it's only 18. Like, you are never outside of bolter range in this game. Yeah, so like the long distance sniper kind of shooting is not going to be taken advantage of. Yeah, and you're going to end up, because you're tussling over points very close together usually, or in a small room, you need to have melee options. Uh, Tau is going to fucking hate this game mode, if I'm being honest. I cannot see Tau being good in this. Yeah, especially if, like, Overwatch is still its Overwatch problem kind of thing. Yeah. Unless you're using flamers. But, yeah, I think that if they continue to support and update rules and stuff like that, there's probably some ways that they can help it. But that is disappointing to hear a bit. Yeah, but overall, I'm still positive on this. Other than, let's get to this. We mentioned back at the beginning, you can't buy the rules for this game mode. You can buy the terrain for it. Great. (laughs) The terrain that can only be used in this game mode. And I guess Kill Team, but no one cares. Sorry, Kill Team fans. Not today. Oof. Maybe a different day. Not today. <laughs> Get him. <laughs> but uh, you can't buy the actual rules for this game, which once again, why are you paying for the rules for this game? It's very annoying. And also, I despised, and I know how angry people are going to be. I'm actually going to despise it less just for the entertainment value that I found out that in the new Ark of Omen book, there's going to be stratagems for some armies. There's going to be new unique enhancements for some armies in yet another 60, 65, whatever dollar book that won't exist in three months. Won't exist in one month, if I'm being honest, looking at. I think I looked for Abaddon three weeks after it was sold, and it's been sold out since, and it probably will just get deleted from the store while saying sold out. Yeah, it was like Abaddon was within a couple weeks. But I did not know that it was going, that the sum modifier was on that i thought it was just here's the update kind of thing that's rather disappointing to learn of (laughs) yeah it only ends up being i think seven or eight factions get it because i think they're going to put the next half of them in like the Ta'al book and then if there's like a secret last book that'll end up with the final ones or the Tao one's just gonna have more yeah although actually no they'll do what they always do they'll anger eric two of the factions will be in white dwarf don't even fucking that's what'll happen because that's what happened in psychic awakening was two of the factions got their updates via white dwarf yeah you just say shit like that to piss me (laughs) off (laughs) so that's that's how that'll work I was all, like, excited, basically, for this episode, this boarding action stuff. I was like, yeah, this sounds cool, and I'm kind of disappointed I wasn't able to play it. I'm looking forward to it. There's a few things that might need some help. And you're like, oh, yeah, but we're probably going to have to wait and figure out how to get White Dwarf. And it's like, you know, motherfucker. My wife has a White Dwarf subscription, so we're good, but it's still something that angers Eric. It's the principle. Yeah, so I want to give it my wholehearted recommendation, but it still has that black eye of these rules should have been supplied on the GW website as like, a, here is the rules for how to play for free. Go buy our terrain set, whatever. Yeah. And then I'd have been a lot happier, especially if we found out that like, hey, the Vashdor book has these new stratagems and stuff, but they're also available online for free. But if you want it in a fancy book, it's in that book. Right. It just makes sense as an alternate method of play. Maybe you have a few exclusive maps tied to that book where it's like, whatever. No one cares if there's a couple bonus missions in there, but not all the missions. Yeah. I don't know, man. On a positive note, the 3D printed train's cool. <laughs> I'm really happy because, like, after we paint it up a bit, it's going to look really good if we ever want to do, like, army shots and stuff. Because I like some of our terrain for that, but this will be a really good neutral terrain to put stuff in front of. And at the same time, like, once we get into some more narrative stuff, I think we could use this 
Yeah. As a final thing, because we haven't brought it up yet, and I'm sure people are screaming because they know we made the budget episode for the $500 armies. I am a big fan of the boarding action boxes so far. Some of them suck, but I'm a big fan of their existence on average. Yeah. I would call that another win for boarding actions. They do seem pretty solid, but yeah, there's always some that are not quite as good as others and whatever, but it is a nice little bonus to the barrier of entry. Yeah. So on that note, though, before we get out of here for next week if you are listening to this episode or watching it there is hopefully still time for this news on wednesday 3 23 you mean 22 3 23 oh no i forgot europeans they're disgusting <laughs> oh. Ugh. anyway there's a big announcement thing from gw and We are doing our live episode for the season for our high-paying patrons the day after on Thursday, March 23rd. Ah, there you go. The neutral. That is probably the day this episode is hitting YouTube. If you're listening to this, you should check what the date is. And if you wanted to pay to get in, you could still do that if there's a few hours left before the live episode occurs. I want that out there for those who are interested. You can read up on it on our Patreon. I made a post that's public that has all the details. There you go. There's probably a link in the description and show notes of this episode. And it's going to be Thursday, March 23rd at 7 EST. EDT. We're in Daylight Saving Times. GMT minus 5. There's no good way to say times. No, there isn't. At 7 o'clock, the only time zone that matters, the rest of you get bent. (laughs) All right, before we get out of here, make sure to do the YouTube pleasantries or whatever, and let's get out of here for the week. Sounds good.